Well, good morning. We try to show deep spiritual videos. So that was a non-example, if you haven't figured that out yet. He traded the van for the moped. So today we're going to talk about wisdom, and uh, we're going to talk about wisdom that shows. You ever feel like you need some wisdom in an area of your life? You ever not know what to do? I think everybody's gone through that. Here's the series verse, James 2.26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So today we're going to talk about three ways to identify wisdom. And this is not just decisions you make, but when you listen to other people and you watch their lives and you see what they do, Jesus always warned us, be careful when somebody says certain things, but their actions are different. Look for the fruit. We talked about that a few weeks ago. I had a neighbor uh, a few years ago who, um, I had a dog that just barked at everybody. And uh, uh, Nikki, we loved Nikki, little Nikki. And she, uh, but she didn't like people uh, other than me. And so, um, but, but she did uh, keep, keep Kyle safe when he was little because she uh, several times found water snakes in his sandbox. And one time, a really big one. Anyway, so this neighbor would come out and the dog would bark. And this neighbor would come out and the dog would bark. And I noticed one day, boy, she hasn't barked in a while. And I was sitting out back. And the neighbor came out, and Nikki went to the fence and sat down. And I thought, what in the world has happened? And he came over, and he started petting her. And I said, okay, you got to tell me what happened, because she hated you a month ago. He goes, yep, no big deal. He said, you know, I know not to yell at dogs. I know you don't scream at them, because that just makes things worse. I know not to harass them. He said, so instead, I just gave her pepperonis. That dog loved him from then on. Now, whether or not pepperonis are healthy or not, you can do your own assessment. But I will tell you, that man was smart and wise. And there's times in life that you have got to decide what you're supposed to do and when you're supposed to do it. Now, knowledge is, we mix it up all the time, knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is knowing facts, knowing even truths, having, knowing principles But wisdom is what's acquired over time. It's knowing what to do with the knowledge. For example, if you're a Floridian, you have used one of these on occasions, right? This is called an umbrella. So yes, you have, and some of you said, don't open that inside, and you're believing a lie, but that's okay. All right, so so here's the thing. You have knowledge about umbrellas, but when you live in Florida for a long time, you develop wisdom about umbrellas. Because you realize that sometimes the way the rain is coming down and how far you are from the door, simply opening your car door, opening the umbrella, you will get more soaked than if you just run in sometimes. And you always have to have the wisdom to know which time is it. Or as my favorite philosopher, Rogers, used to say, you got to know when to hold them. Know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run, right? So, so wisdom's about knowing when. Now, some people could even lie to you about an umbrella. And this is the thing about wisdom. They may come to you and go, oh, I've seen that before. That's, that's used to stab people. What? That's used to, to poke. I saw a TV show one time where the guy picked up a cigar off the ground with it. Boy, that goes way back. Do you remember that one? Oscar Madison, thank you so much. Did you catch that, Mike? I went way back to the 70s. Michelle, the 70s were a time. Okay. Anyway, so, so you know, and they'll, they'll lie to you about something. So how do you know if what they're saying is true? You say, God, you've given me knowledge. Now give me wisdom. And what we're going to talk about today is how, as believers, we develop this. And so let me ask you this question. Oh, oh, I, your song made me think of this. So, you know, they have that, that line in, in your blood ran, your love ran red. That says, I'm in awe of you. So in the Old Testament, uh, uh, it says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It says it in Proverbs 9.10. It says it in the Psalms. The fear of God. And and we, as Americans, translate that word uh, fear as like scared. It doesn't mean scared. It means in awe. If you want wisdom, you need to be in awe of what God does. You need to be in awe of what God can do. So let me ask you this question. Is your life beautiful? Now you're going to hear where this passage talks about how a beautiful life is a witness 
to other people. And what does that mean to have a beautiful life? See, in the information age, people can look up anything, but it doesn't make them wise. And the difficulty is you have a lot of people with information that are using it improperly, but they think they're wise, and gullible people will follow them. And you've seen all kinds of things, right? And, and we think, well, what is that about? And here's the deal what we know, need to know. God wants us to have wisdom, not just from knowing his word, not just knowing about him, but from doing what he's called us to do. And being in all of him, like the song said, that's the beginning. But others will notice the beauty of wisdom in your life, and my prayer is they'll find their way home as they see God helping you to make wise decisions. So here's a couple things. Number one, true wisdom shows in humble deeds. Now, we've been going through the book of James. Remember, James is Jesus' uh, uh, brother, uh, half-brother. I know we talk about that, but... Uh, uh, James is talking to the early church. James is probably the first book of the New Testament that was written. And as James is talking to this early Jewish church, he's showing them what really matters. And he says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life. Now we're going to come back to that word good, because in English, good means good. Just Right? It's a real plain word, right? Good. You know, if I ask you how your day is, good. How was that sandwich? Good. How's so-and-so doing? Good. What does that mean? No idea. Right? You ever tell somebody you're good and you're not? Okay, so we're going to define this word in a minute. By their good life, by deeds done in, what's the next word? Humility that comes from wisdom. Now, this word, let them show it by their good life. It's a word that even Plato used that was, it meant beautiful. It meant noble. It meant handsome. It, it meant a life that when you looked at it, you went, wow. And so it says, let them show it. How are you going to show that, that you have wisdom from God? By living the life God's called you to live, by carrying it out, your beautiful life. In Matthew 7, Jesus describes what wisdom looks like. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine. Now, a lot of people are going to hear God's word today. There's going to be a lot of people sitting in churches. A lot of you will sit in here in church. But here's where you get wisdom, right here. And puts them into practice. It's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And that's not talking about the wrestler slash football player slash actor. And in Florida, we should know. Built this house upon the rock, right? You got to dig down. You got to build it on the rock. The rain came down. The streams rose. The wind blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had its foundation on the rock. Listen, when you become wise in God's word and you apply what he says, what happens? When the storms of life come, and they will come. It didn't say might come. When the storms of life come, Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble. You'll stand. Why? Because you've built your house upon the rock. You know, it's hard to know in our society when somebody lacks wisdom, but there's a certain group of people that I am related to that have some very uh, uh, funny things that they do, and sometimes we doubt their wisdom. So I'm going to point out my forefathers and give you some, you might be a rednecks. Here we go. You might be a redneck if you think the last words to the Star Spangled Banner are, gentlemen, start your engines. You might be a redneck if your mother has ammo on her Christmas list. You might be a redneck if the taillight covers of your car are made of red tape. You might be a redneck if you've ever cut your grass and found a car. You might be a redneck if you come home from the garbage dump and you have more than you left with. You might be a redneck if, like me, the directions to your house include turn off the paved road. If your dog and wallet are on a chain. This is important to me. If you've ever made change in the offering plate. And last but not least, and this I have heard, you hear the sound of a, bur a beer, not a bird, of a beer being opened during a eulogy. And yes, your pastor has experienced that while doing a funeral, just so you know. Number two, how does fake wisdom? Fake wisdom shows in prideful talk or prideful speech. It's demonstrated. We, we, we see it there. You know, a few years ago, I tried to hire a lawnmower guy, and 
he came to my house, and I'll never forget, he, when he came, he told me what a good lawn man he was. And I thought, well, this guy seems pretty sharp. He was recommended by a friend, and I thought, well, he seems sharp. And then, not only did he do that, he looked across the street and said, see how they're cutting that yard? They're not cutting that yard right. And I went, really? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, they're supposed to cut it. And he went into detail about the height and the edges and all this stuff. And I was like, wow, this guy really knows his stuff. So I hired him, and he showed up one time. And a month later, during the summer, in Florida, he hadn't shown back up. So I called him, because I had already paid him. And I said, what's going on? And he said, oh, I'll be out there any day. Didn't come, didn't come, didn't come. So I called my friend who recommended him. I said, what's going on with this lawn guy? She goes, I don't know, he's terrible. <laughs> what happened? This guy could talk about things, but he couldn't do things. Now, we've all been there. We got out of college one day. Remember those days when you thought you knew everything? And then you had to learn how to do it? And some of you have hired people like that. You, you hired them, and they knew everything. And then they started acting on it and went, oh, I don't, I don't think they know as much as I thought they knew. A lot of us are that way. And so James challenges the early church about being honest. And here's where he picks up in verse 14. But if you harbor bitter envy, that means you look at other people and you're jealous of what they have or you're jealous of how their life is, if you harbor it, if you're hanging on to it, if you're hiding bitter envy and selfish ambition. What's selfish ambition? Me, 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 me. More me, more me, more me. What are you doing talking about yourself? Talk about me, right? In your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. <laughs> James is saying, listen, even if you do that, don't harbor it. Don't we call it a harbor because it means hidden. Don't, don't, don't push it. Just be honest about it. And then he goes on. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual. And if that's not enough, he says it's demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find what? Disorder and every evil practice. So what happens in churches? You get people who have their own agenda, and it's about them, and they destroy what's going on in the church. And that's what James was concerned about in the early church. So how does he, what is he saying about it? He's saying that the answer is be honest about it. If you struggle with selfishness and selfish ambition, which I believe we all do at times, you have to say to God, God, forgive me for that. Sometimes you have to say, Holy Spirit, would you show me any self-centeredness in my heart? Show me those times when I think I'm a little better than somebody else for whatever reason. You pick your reason. And those times, what does that consider? That's selfish ambition. That's selfish pride. God, would you help me as I deal with it? And just confess it to him. By the way, can I tell you about confession real quick? When you confess sin, God doesn't say, really? You're not confessing sin because God needs to know what you did. You're confessing sin so that you know what you did. The reason for confession is to bring your sin before God, and he doesn't say, you did what? He says, finally, the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. And what does he do? He forgives our sin. But we confess it to him. Why? To realize, hey, this is where I'm at. And so James warns us early on. He says, listen, if you have these things going on in your heart, don't be dishonest, but just be vulnerable. Just be authentic. Be genuine. We live in a fake world, don't we? A lot of plastic people. How you doing? Good to see you. Oh, it's so okay, great, right? And he says, just be honest about it. Be honest. Go to God. God, I need your help in this area. Jesus continues in Matthew 7, verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice. So, so both these groups have heard what Jesus said. They've, they've read the Bible. They've spent time in God's Word. They've listened to what Jesus said, but they don't put it into practice. Is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down. The streams rose. The wind blew against and beat the house. What happened? It fell with a great crash. Why? They talked about loving Jesus. They talked about knowing Jesus. They talked about God's word. They might have even memorized a lot of scripture. By the way, Satan knows scripture better than you ever will. But they didn't act on it. They didn't do what they were called to do. I don't know if you've ever watched a show. I said this last night and people looked at me. I heard birds chirp. It was silence in the room. I said, have you ever watched 
cabin masters in Maine. That's a DIY show, and this is the response I got. No idea, no idea. So let me tell you something about cabin masters. They go up to Maine, and they have these like 50, 80, 100-year-old cabins on lakes, beautiful lakes, horrible cabins. And the first thing they do almost every show is they go in, and they look at the cabin that's leaning, and they realize, you know what's wrong with it to start with? The foundation. So a lot of times they have to go in and jack these cabins up, dig out footers, bring concrete, add the stone that are going to be based on what? And level it and make it right. Listen, we're the same way when we don't have our foundation on Christ and his word. And when we don't apply what we've learned, the foundation starts to get off. When we start to think we have our act together, we're a little better than so, you know, so-and-so would be better if they could just figure out what I figured out. That selfish ambition. Can we learn how to help others? Let me tell you one of the smartest things you'll learn is when not to help other people. Did you hear what I just said? Now, that sounds pagan, doesn't it? But there are times where helping somebody is the worst thing you can do. What? Yeah, sometimes the best way to help somebody, you ready? Is to not help them. Let, let them flounder. Let them, let them recognize that they're having difficulty so they can get to the point. Because otherwise you'll be enabling them. I mean, if your friend was an alcoholic and came to you and said, I just need a beer, and you handed them a beer, I'm helping them. Guess what? Nay, nay. And so how do you know when to do that? You ask for wisdom from God. And some of that is practice. Some of it you learn. For a church, we don't give out cash to people who show up at our doorstep. Did you know that? Now, we'll give anybody food. I tell people all the time, we'll give a crack addict food. Nobody should go hungry in America with the pastor this fat. Right? Right? I got plenty of food. We'll share. But I'm not going to help you in your addiction. I'm not going to help you in your struggle. Why? Because sometimes God's teaching you something, and I don't want to short circuit what God's trying to teach you in life. And so we have to be careful. God, I want to help to be on the foundation. I love this from Dear Abby. The best index to a person's character is how he treats people who can't do him any good and how he treats people who can't fight back. From working in a restaurant, I can tell you those servers know who good people are and who not good people are. Because when they don't get something just right, we discover people's character. By the way, did you know there are big corporations that one of the first things they do in an interview is take somebody out to eat and they set up the waitress or waiter ahead of time and they tell the waitress or waiter, give me the worst service you can. So they sit down with this new client and the server comes and spills something. The server doesn't bring something. The server brings the wrong thing. All this stuff and the boss is watching to see how is this new person going to react? Would you be hired? You could tell a lot about people by how they treat people who can't help them, who don't push them forward, when they don't get the sale, when they don't get the job, when they don't need them anymore. Number three, true wisdom humbly considers others. Most of you have heard me talk about when I met Harold Brantley. He did a sermon at the church I was at. I was in my 20s, and I walked up to him. This is about 30-something years ago. I'm not telling you how many 30-somethings. And I walked up to him, and I said, Harold, I like you, but I didn't like your sermon. Now, Harold's in his 50s, head of the missions for Brevard Baptist, and I'm a 20-something youth pastor who still doesn't know what he's doing. And Harold could have looked at me and said, who do you think you are? You haven't been to seminary? You barely have Bible training. How long have you been working here? Six months? Who do you think you are? But you know what Harold said? He looked at me and said, all right, Eric. Eric, right? Let's go to lunch and talk about it. Now, Harold didn't have to spend any time with me, but for the next 30 years almost, he poured his life into a young man who thought he was right. And years later, Harold would tell people everywhere we went, did you hear how we met? Eric, tell him the end of the story. All right, Harold. You were right about what you preached. Is that what you wanted to hear? Yep, just wanted you to admit it again. <laughs> Harold got Alzheimer's, started losing his memory. We went to lunch one time with Jackie, and he couldn't remember a lot of things. But in the middle of lunch, I'll never forget, he looked at me and he said, Eric, 
You remember what happened when we met? You can't even remember your wife's name and you still remember that story? I looked at Jackie, I said, can't he forget that story? And you know why it made such an impression on me? Because he knew what to say and how to say it. He could have easily let his pride get to him and say, I don't need you. But instead, for 30 years, he was able to pour his life into something and someone who he chose to be humble. And I went to Harold every single week and asked him questions about ministry and about life. You know, if you haven't been around Steve McCrory lately, Steve McCrory feels a call to ministry. And uh, uh, hopefully, like all the last three pastors uh, that we were part of their ordination, we keep sending people out of our church and... I'm glad to plant other churches, but a couple of you guys need to stay. But, uh, but anyway, so, so but, but Steve has, has represented that, and, he's, and we see him ministering at the port ministry and other places. And so we as a church feel like he's somebody who walks in humility and wants to be ordained, and we're going to look towards ordaining Steve. And I think that's an awesome part of what we do. Listen to what it says in James 3, 17 and 18. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure. Then, peace-loving. Do you know anybody who loves to fight? They lack of wisdom. You know, people who love to get in an argument about everything, you probably don't want to hang around them. If you're that person, can I tell you, you might be lacking wisdom. If you like to fight with everybody about everything, peace loving. Does that describe you? Does that describe me? Considerate. Submissive. Full of mercy. By the way, the word mercy here means compassion. It means you really care about the other person. You care about them. And good fruit. Impartial and sincere. And then I love this. Peacemakers who sow in peace. They used to just throw seed, right? Who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. You know, I have to remember all the time that I am not responsible for making people grow. Do you know what I'm responsible for doing? Sowing the seeds God's given me. And you know what you're responsible for doing? Sowing the seeds God's given you. Sometimes when you say and do what God wants you to do, people won't appreciate it. You're not doing it for people. And God sometimes will even allow people to not notice what you do so that you have to look at your motivation for doing it. So you work in the church and you help in the nursery and somebody yells at you and you go, I'm not doing this anymore. That's the day that you need to look in the mirror and go, I've been doing it for myself. Lord, forgive me. You're responsible for the seeds. And by the way, pastors struggle with the same thing. We get letters and notes from people. Can't believe you did this, pastor. You know, I could work at Publix. It'd be a lot easier, right? Actually, no, my sister works at Publix. I don't want to do that either, right? But, but the truth is what? We're not responsible for how people respond. We're responsible for what God calls us to do. What are you sowing? What are you sowing into your children's lives? What are you sowing into your neighbor's lives? What are you sowing into the people that know you most? Is it peace and joy or is it argument and frustration? You're responsible for what seeds you plant. You're not always responsible for what happens with them, but you're responsible for what seeds you sow. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says this, What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. See, where does this seed come from? It comes from the Spirit that's in us, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, not just in the head, but words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. And then a few verses later it says, the person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things. But such a person isn't subject to just merely human judgments. Why? For who has known the mind of the Lord to instruct him? And I love this. Memorize this. Take this verse home with you. But we have the mind of Christ. God, I need wisdom in my life. He says, act on the things I've given you. But God, I want you to fix this way out here. Sow the seeds I've given you. But God, what about this way over there? Sow the seeds. That I've given you. Can I tell you when I first became a Christian and I looked back a year later, I'll never forget the reality of looking back and going, wow. Before I was a Christian, I thought about myself all the time. All the time. And when I gave my life to Christ, what was the big change for me? I began looking at others with compassion. 
I began caring about what mattered to them. I began looking for ways to be an encouragement to them, not just so they could say, nice job, way to go, but just to encourage them on their journey. What changed about your life when you gave your life to the Lord? Is your life beautiful? Do other people look at your life and see a noble life and say, I want what they have. That was my best experience in high school, a year after I became a Christian as a senior in high school, sitting at a table for study hall. And one of the girls across from me looked at me and said, something's changed about you. And I was able to share what God had done in my life. What's God done in your life? Has he given you wisdom? If he has, then I want to encourage you, do what's right. Spend time in awe of him. The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So spend time every day in awe of him, whether it's through song or prayer or thanksgiving or praise or just, hey, going for a walk on the beach and thanking God for what he's given you. And when you do that, I believe others will notice the beauty and the wisdom that God is putting in your life. And my prayer is, as you throw those beautiful seeds, as you share what God's done for you, that many will receive those seeds and come to know Christ for eternity. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender your life to him, just like I did as a senior, just before my senior year in high school, where I said, Jesus, I don't even know if I'm a Christian, but I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose again, and I want to surrender my life to you. I don't want to just know about you, but I want to surrender my life to you. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you after the service. Maybe you're here, and the truth is, you're a Christian, but you've been harboring <laughs> selfish envy, bitterness, all those things that are easy. Just be honest with God about them. Be sincere. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just and will forgive you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, thank you for these moments together in your word. We thank you for the book of James. We thank you, Lord, that your word has been passed down to us for thousands of years. And here it is applying to our lives today because your word is living and active and sharper and cuts to our hearts. So, Lord, help us not just hear the word but help us to apply it to our lives so that wisdom will flow out of our lives. Lord, may we do that today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. We normally have